God bless you. Thanks for having me today. Well, it's great to be here with you. And, uh, you know, I've heard preachers get up and say, you know, this is better than being in jail. I always thought that wasn't much of a comparison, though. <laughs> David said uh, to spend a day in thy house would be better than spending a thousand days out in the world, properly spent in the, in the house of God. So we're glad you're here. You're in a safe place. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, um, God, and he is God, he, um, he shares the uh, function, identity, and mission of Yahweh, or Jehovah, God. Jesus Christ is God, and he has one mission. We commonly call it the Great Commission. And I know this is your mission's emphasis month, and I hope, I hope that you'll start reading your Bible differently. You know there are over 600 passages in the Bible that refer to all nations, all peoples, or something uh, like that. And I want to tell you that this book is about God's mission. Now, somebody might say, well, what is God's mission really? And I, if I were to ask, and I'm not going to because I'd be afraid to, but what is God's mission? I'm going to tell you what I believe it is in short. God's mission is to make himself known to all peoples. But there's a lot of people around the world today that don't know, they don't realize, they don't understand that God has a son and his name is Jesus and Jesus Christ said, and it, the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ, that he is the only way. I'm not asking you to raise your hand, but I trust you're with me on this. There's only one way to eternal life, Amen. and that's through Jesus Christ. Amen. But if they don't know, if they've never heard, they're not on their way to heaven. They're not on their way to spending eternity in the presence of God. In fact, they will suffer the, the consequences of their sin forever and ever in a horrible place called the lake of fire. Amen. Now that's not really the primary reason why we even go to try to win the lost. And that might come as a shock too, but the reason we go to try to win the lost is so that he'll be glorified by representatives from every kindred, trung, tongue, tribe, and nation. And I have my wife with me today. She's standing at the back door, but don't turn around and look at her. And I have my grandson. She's scared to death that he'll misbehave. And I guarantee you he probably will. But anyway, we have Melissa and Ronan with us. And we also have some, also some guests with us today. And I want you to get to know them, and I want you to love them because I love them, and uh, they're very special people. I want to introduce to you the Pritchard family who is visiting with us, and I hope I don't do too bad a job today because they had plans to go somewhere else to church this morning, and they found out I was preaching, and they followed me over here. Amen. So anyway, but um, we have uh, Philip and Sarah, and they've served as missionaries for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years in Cape Verde. And then we have their children. We have Mason, Micah, uh, Sophia, uh, Sadie, and McLean visiting with us also. They're with their mom and dad. Amen. But they've been serving with Preach Ministries. And I asked Brother Philip if he had some prayer cards. And uh, he wouldn't he wouldn't distribute those. But if you'd ask him for one, I imagine he'd give it to you if you promise to pray for them. But they're working with Preach Ministries, and that's a ministry started by uh, Philip's dad, who needs our prayers. He's um, had some real serious physical challenge in recent years, and it goes back to a very serious accident that he had, uh, I believe, in Mozambique, Africa. But their ministry had mainly to do, and has mainly to do, with uh, countries in Africa where they speak Portuguese. And Philip grew up on the mission field in Brazil and later uh, then uh, ministering in Africa with his wife, Sarah. Now, Sarah's real special. Um, those of you that 
have known us for a long time know that we spent about almost six years in Western Canada and uh, we started a church and we helped start some others while we were there. And uh, in one of those churches that I had pastor for a time uh, was Sarah. She was quite a bit younger too then. In fact, uh, Sarah and her family, they came back to the United States with us. And I believe Sarah was eight years old. I think she was about eight years and one month when uh, she came back. So that was way back in 1995. So anyway, we have a special love for Sarah and her family. And uh, we love Philip too. And uh, so anyway, we want you to get to meet them after the service as well. Now, most of you know us probably as missionaries to this country here. I won't give you a quiz over what that flag represents, but that's a certain island nation that's uh, in uh, the Caribbean, south of Florida, about 90 miles, and we call it a restricted access country, okay? And so we spent some time there. And, uh, but about two and a half years ago, um, I took a trip to southwestern Columbia, and the last two years, uh, we've had an apartment, and we've been working with um, uh, Bible Baptist Church, Baptist Bible Church, Loving Christ, Loving Christ Bible Baptist Church in Pasto Larino, Colombia. And we're famous, we're probably more famous for something other than the production of coffee, and that's cocaine. And for a long time, uh, missionary activity was very suppressed in Colombia, and Things have changed gradually, and, and uh, we're glad for the door of opportunity. Brother Lusby mentioned that we have uh, approximately um, 28 students in our Bible college that we started uh, just a little over a year ago, and um, I had the opportunity to teach missions uh, this past February uh, there, and I've been home for about uh, two and a half weeks and plan to go back uh, to teach another round. Someone is teaching in my absence, but we have 28 students that are studying for the ministry, and that's about 40% of the church. The congregation is probably about the size of what's here today, maybe not, not hardly. Um, so um, We've been privileged to be able to do that. There's been a great amount of interest in, um, in learning the ministry. And we believe that God has uh, given us a verse for that. Uh, actually, a lot more than one verse. But let me share 2 Timothy 2.2 2, where it says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. I know I've told you this before, but there are four generations of believers in that, in that verse of Scripture. There was uh, Paul, who taught Timothy, who taught faithful men, who were to teach others also. Aren't you glad that throughout every generation people have obeyed that, and they've been training and teaching uh, faithful men so that they would teach others also, so that we would have... Aren't you glad the gospel got to your home? And the reason I got to your home is because uh, of sent ones. That's really what the word missionary means. Now, I don't believe that every believer is called to be a foreign missionary, but I do believe that every believer should struggle with that possibility. And I do believe this, that every one of us is called upon, if we're really in line, if we're in step with the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought to want to be a part of his mission. Amen. So that means that we can pray, we can help send someone to go, and we go ourselves. And all of us are going to go somewhere in the morning, amen? amen. We're going to touch lives. And we have the obligation to communicate our faith in Jesus Christ, because he is the one true and living God, and there is no hope apart from him. Amen? Amen. Y'all with me on that? And so that is God's mission, is to make him known. Now, we start our Bible Institute, and about a year ago, we were able to acquire a couple pieces of printing equipment. 
One of the things that I taught in the very beginning was the history of the Spanish Bible, the, the Reina Valera Bible. And while I was teaching on that, I added a little unit at the end about how God's people have always really had the responsibility to be the custodians of God's word. And rather miraculous, and I don't have time to tell you because uh, time's running short, and I want to show you a three-minute video of how God has used that ministry. We started um, printing John and Romans in Spanish. God gave us a beautiful couple, Colombian couple, to head up that ministry. And we're currently doing our fourth run of John and Romans for distribution. We're working in the city of Pasto. It took us a, took us a few years to get through Pasto. There are over 500,000 people in the city of Pasto, Nariño, which is the capital of the department or state of Nariño, southwest Colombia. We border Ecuador and, uh, and the Pacific Ocean um, on the west. So anyway, we've had uh, a couple other campaigns where we have uh, saturated uh, villages and small cities with John and Romans in every home, uh, to every home uh, campaign, to every creature campaign, with uh, gospel tracts. We're now inserting a nice letter uh, explaining the reason for why we're distributing gospels of John and Romans to Tocando, knocking on doors, uh, knocking on every door, and uh, this summer, we have something that uh, we're planning that I've not been able to have a part in anything like it since really I left Canada. But uh, there's a city called Fusagasuga, about two hours south of Bogota. And uh, the first week of July, we're going to have a campaign. And we're anticipating 20 to 25 people from Pasto coming up, 13, 14 hour bus ride to Fusa and uh, helping us knock on doors. We hope to have uh, between 20 and 25 pairs of people to go out knocking on doors, as well as other activities. And at the end, we hope to leave the new pastor of the new church a whole stack of prospect cards of people that have either received Christ, expressed interest, come to the meetings, uh, had some contact, favorable contact with the church. and. Um, filter through a lot of homes and help this new church really get a good start. So we're excited about that and for the Colombian pastor, his name is Ferne Serrat uh, and so pray for him as well. We'll say more about that in our letter. I want to show you a little bit about uh, some printing that was done and a campaign that we had. It's about three minutes. Are we queued up for that, brother? Yeah. All right, so this is, hope you'll enjoy. Hoy quiero contarte de un Dios que con sus manos formó todo lo que existe y existió. Jehová, Él es el gran yo soy, tres veces santo es. Y el mar me obedece. ¿Quién como tú, Jehová? Entre los dioses, 
¿Quién como tú? Magnífico en santidad. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your patience uh, with that. I hope that you enjoyed seeing that from start to finish, uh, the production of John and Romans. And I do invite you to have a look at our table. We have some examples of those if you want to have a look at those. And we appreciate your prayers, your support, financial, over these many years for our ministry. And you truly have had a part. And we thank you, Father. Or we thank you, folks, for that. We thank the Father, too. Amen. All right. Um, and also, uh, we'll have some of these available, too, if you'd like to have one of the Pritchard family. The one of the Rowe family is always still suitable for framing or for farming. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to Mark chapter 11. You were supposed to laugh at that. Mark chapter 11. Now, do I need this? Well, um, Mark chapter 11 and verse uh, 11. I think we'll start reading at verse 15 for time's sake. Um, I want to talk to you for the next few minutes about the incident at the temple. Familiar story, I think, to most of us. <clears throat> says, <coughs> and they, the disciples and Jesus, came to Jerusalem. Mark chapter 11, verse 11. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it, Brother Nelson. It says, And Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves? And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. Let's bow our heads and make our prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you once again for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father for his death, burial, and resurrection. We thank you for the good news of the gospel. We thank you, Father, that we've been entrusted with, with um, this good news. And so I pray, Father, that we'd be faithful stewards. I pray that you bless this month and the life of the church. And I pray that every, every day, every week of the year, we would think about your mission and what your will for our life is regarding that mission. So, Lord, I pray that we'd love you more and serve you better. I pray that you'd use uh, uh, your word today to speak to our hearts and help us to make good decisions. And we ask it all for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, and in his name we ask it, amen. All right. The Lord Jesus Christ here is uh, doing what we commonly call cleansing the temple. Now, I have a friend, and... He said to me several years ago, I had an opportunity to lead him to the Lord, 
And he said, I don't like it when they sell books and tapes in the, in the back of the church. He said, uh, Jesus, uh, he stopped all that. And I said, well, with all due respect, that's not really what that passage is talking about. Now, if, if you don't want to sell books and tapes in the back, in, in the other part of the, uh, of the building, that's okay with me. I don't have a problem uh, either way so much, but that's not really the teaching here from this passage of Scripture, and I'd like to be clear about that. The Lord Jesus Christ, I want to tell you, has one mission, and that's to make all people know Him. Now, that's a really big deal. That was a really big deal back then because a lot of people didn't understand that. Yea, even His own disciples didn't understand. something we could all probably do a, a, a better job at, and uh, so we need to consider, you know, who all God wants me to pray for this month, and uh, maybe maybe God wants us to uh, to maybe give a little more, amen, I'm, I'm sure that he's blessed us, and he's blessed us, not so that we'll have more, but so that we'll have more to bless others with, and he's blessed us to be a blessing, and that's another message. Now, I won't preach them all today. I'll touch on two or three of them. Are you picking me up? Oh, well, maybe I need to get in here and dig it out and see. All right, I need, I need all the help I can get, brother. Is anybody having trouble hearing me? All right. Sometimes I wander around, and sometimes I can't find my way back. Amen. But anyway... I don't know what I was saying. I'm sure it was important. <laughs> but the Lord Jesus Christ here and his disciples came to the temple one day and they stopped all unauthorized bypass through the court of the Gentiles and they basically shut down the whole temple complex for a number of hours. That's what happened. And it was pretty big. I don't know, maybe 15, 20 acres. I don't know. It was a good-sized piece of real estate. We're talking about Herod's temple. Solomon's temple had been destroyed. They took, I think Jesus said they took 70 years, or his opponents said that they took 70, they took 70 years to build the temple. And uh, Jesus said he was going to destroy it and raise it up, but they didn't understand. They were talking about Herod's temple, and Jesus was talking about another temple. Amen. But 70 years, and it was spectacular. And it had a rather large courtyard dedicated for the Gentiles to worship. It was called the Court of the Gentiles. And all the Jews had to pass through the court of the Gentiles to get to their place of worship as well. Now, in the temple complex, in the temple complex, there were people that were changing money. Let's see. I have a piece here. You know, I don't even know who's on our quarter. Is that George Washington or Thomas Jefferson? Well, anyway, it's got the figure of a man on it, and it's got a buffalo on the back of it, all right? 
the Jews, the religious Jews, would not receive a coin with the image of a man on it. And the Roman coins had the figure of Caesar on it. So they had money changers. The Jewish money had a stock of wheat or something like that on it. Okay? So they were supposedly doing a good thing. They were changing money so people could have the correct money. Thank you. Washington. I kind of thought so, but thank you. I got somebody looking it up here, so I got somebody checking me out on what I'm saying, so I have to be careful. All right. So here's... Here, here are the money changers, because there are people that are coming from a long ways away to the temple, to Jerusalem, and, and some of them, many of them, to worship. And so they've come from a great distance, so they, uh, they couldn't hook up a, a, a livestock trailer on the back of the chariot and transport animals, so they had to come and they had to buy their animal that they were going to offer for sacrifice. So they were selling sacrificial animals, animals for sacrifice, kosher. And there were other people that came too, and they brought their animal, but some religious guy would say, I'm sorry, but your animal has a defect. You need to buy one of ours. It's already been pre-approved. And so they would sell them an animal that was approved, that was kosher, that was acceptable for their sacrifice. You follow me? Amen. Well, <clears throat> for a period of hours, the Lord Jesus Christ, he got there. And aren't you tired of all these pictures? Of, the Bible says we're not supposed to make images anyway of God. Because, but you know... We got to be careful because we make images. Some temple courtyard. Can I show you the, pro the purpose of the temple? Time is now fleeting. But let's go to um, 1 Kings. And if you don't go fast, just listen. But 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon is praying his dedicatory prayer in the temple. Is this on? Do I need it? Okay. I probably don't need it. But 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon said in his prayer of dedication, when heaven is shut up, verse 35, 1 Kings 8, 35, when heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou afflictest them, then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel. Okay. Verse uh, 39, then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and do and give to every man according to his ways whose heart thou knowest for thou even thou only knowest the hearts of all the children of men. Verse 40. That they may fear thee all the days that they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers. Now that's for the people of Israel. That's for the Jew. Verse 40. He continues. That they may fear thee all the days that they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers. Verse 41. Moreover, concerning a stranger... That is not of thy people Israel. All right, we're talking about everybody else. We're talking about Gentiles now. It says, That is not of thy people's sake, 
for they shall hear of thy great name and of thy strong hand and of thy stretched out arm when he shall come and pray toward this house. In other words, Solomon anticipated that there'd be people come from a long way off to worship at that temple because they would hear the great name of Jehovah God and they would come to worship him. So the command in the Old Testament was to come and see and for us in our day and time, we're, Israel's not the church and, and the church's not Israel but the command for us as the church as the people of God is to go and tell their command was to come and see and Solomon said and they will come for they will, they, for they will hear of thy great name in verse 42 now I want to go ahead and get to verse 59 and let these words he's wrapping it up now his prayer of dedication for the temple. And let these my words wherewith I have made supplication before the Lord be nigh unto the Lord our God day and night that he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel at all times as the matter shall require. Verse 60, that all the people of the earth may know our antenna should already be going up that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord, all caps, Jehovah, Jave, that the Lord is God and that there is none else. So hear the prayer of your servants, your people Israel. Hear the prayer of the strangers that come and hear of your great name because they will hear of your great name. And when they come, hear their prayer that all the people of the earth might know you, God. That all the people of the earth may know that the Lord Jehovah is God and that there is none else. Can I tell you that the purpose of the temple was to make God known and for the nations to come and to worship him and to offer sacrifice to him. Amen? Amen? That was the whole purpose. Now Isaiah had something to say about this. And if you want to turn to Isaiah chapter 56, I want to just spend a couple minutes there. Isaiah 56 and then I want to give you my concluding thoughts. I want to do that in the next couple of minutes, but I won't make it. But just hang with me. It won't be much longer. Isaiah chapter 56 and verses 3 through 8 says, Wherefore have we fasted? I'm sorry, that's 58. Excuse me. 56. Isaiah 56, verse 3. Neither let the son of the stranger which that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs, that keep my Sabbaths, and choose the things that please me, and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone to keep the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. If you're looking for a missionary verse, that's a good one right there. So that's the one, that's, that's the passage that the Lord Jesus Christ quoted as he's upending tables of the money changers and those that are selling animal sacrifices in the temple of the Lord, basically the courtyard of the Gentiles. And so he uproots the tables and he said, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer among all nations, but ye have made it a house of thieves and robbers, something like that. Hmm. Interesting. Why did the Lord Jesus Christ react so violently? I want to tell you, he was really mad. 
You know why Jesus was really mad? It wasn't just because that they were robbing the people, charging them exorbitant prices, very inflated prices for the merchandise. It wasn't the fact that so much that they were doing that. It was the fact that the Gentiles had been crowded out of their place of worship. Hmm. So the question is, is there anything in my life, is there anything in my church that chokes off mission? Do I have the right attitude? Do I have the right attitude about people coming across our borders without papers? Hmm. Well, now I touched on something I probably shouldn't have, but the fact of the matter is they come, and they bring their Catholicism with them, and they bring other stuff with them, other religions with them, that I don't agree with at all, that do it, that does everything it can to point them away from Jesus and not to Jesus. But I, as a believer, I have a responsibility, amen? And so, I'm just saying that it could be, I, I don't like this term, I don't even know, I'm not even sure where, I'm, I'm really gonna get myself in trouble here. I don't even know what this Christian nationalist is, but uh, I was, if I was going to vote for anybody, I'd vote for, uh, in favor of Jesus, amen. <laughs> and he's for all peoples. And you know what? God's sovereignty and laws to handle on anything. And whatever happens this year in the elections, you just mark it down. God allowed it to happen, and he has a reason for it to happen. And God may not, God, you know, I almost died last fall. Thank the Lord I didn't, but I win either way, amen. But I had a ruptured appendix and a perforated colon, and I was nine days in the hospital, and uh, the, the surgeon told me, now he said this, I didn't necessarily, I'm just repeating what he said. He said, you got here just in time. And I've had a great comeback. And so God's good no matter what he try, whatever, whatever he does. Listen, he's going to allow some circumstances to come to us that may not always be favorable. But maybe it's because... Uh, Maybe it's because uh, he wants us to depend more on him. Maybe it's because he wants the world to see just how a genuine, true Christian would react with these set of circumstances. I want to tell you that there are people in, in, in various countries that I know right now, and they have the same problems we do. And basically, you have the same problems that they have. You know, we have problems with our children. We have problems with our parents. We have problems uh, uh, economically. We have problems with our work. We have, we have basically pretty much the same. We, 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 we have anxiety over things, and God just wants us to trust him because he hasn't lost control over anything and focus on what's really important. But do, we, do I have an attitude? Do I have something in my life, something in my maybe lack of knowledge about understanding about what God's mission is that chokes mission off. But the Gentiles have been crowded out. There was no place left included for them. And that's what solicited the Lord Jesus Christ's violent reaction that day. And so what would he change about our church, about each of us individually? What would the Lord Jesus Christ change if he were to walk in here today? What would he change? So let's think about that. Is there something that is preventing me from having an all people's mentality of reaching all people's? Now, I've got a lot more notes here, and I'd really like to cap it off well, but all my notes are in Spanish because I couldn't find my English message. But can I tell you that the purpose of the temple was, was twisted. 
It was abused. Can I tell you, the church has a purpose. What is the purpose? To make him known. What are some of the obstacles to the evangelization of all peoples? Prejudice, arrogance, national pride, lack of prayer for the nations, lack of being passionate about what God is passionate about, lack of compassion. All these things solicit the violent reaction of the Lord Jesus Christ. So before we go today, let's do a little self-exam. What is the application for us? Am I functioning in line with the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is my church doing what we need to do to reach other nations? Someone said this. I actually quoted this to somebody, and they kind of disagreed with me this past week, and I didn't, I didn't try to explain it. I believe it. Brother Lesby, I think, I think missions is the only excuse that any New Testament church has for existence. Now, I said New Testament church. Not everything that has a steeple and a tax-exempt status is a church. Amen. But if we're a New Testament church, we've got to be concerned about God's mission. We need to be passionate about representatives in the end from every people group being present to worship him forever and ever. It'd be more exciting than any ball game we ever went to, amen. To hear people in it from every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation praising and glorifying him. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Maybe you're here today, and you've never had a salvation experience. You really couldn't say that you knew the Lord Jesus Christ. It's God's desire that everyone be saved. He says in the Bible, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you don't have the the assurance that you'd spend eternity in your presence if you were to fall over dead before you got out of the parking lot today. If you don't have that, if you don't have that confidence, could I invite you to come and let uh, the preacher or someone take a Bible and show you exactly what the Bible says about living and having eternal life? Maybe there's one here in a crowd this size. I wouldn't be surprised. And then no one should be ashamed. What should concern us is if someone were to leave today, everyone would rejoice if someone came and got saved today. No one should leave without having that assurance. Could I invite you to come and forward or stay behind and seek someone out that could take the Bible and show you how to be saved today and know that you're on your way to heaven? Now, maybe you've been saved for a long time and part of this church and uh, everything between you and the Lord is good. Maybe God, the Holy Spirit, has talked to you, has spoken to your heart today about some greater involvement in the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ to make him known. Maybe God's laying someone on your heart that you haven't witnessed to, that you rub shoulders with through the week, and you need to tell them. Maybe God's spoken to your heart about surrendering your life to whatever God's will for your life is, and that might be going somewhere else and taking the gospel and preaching uh, somewhere uh, a little further than just Cincinnati. How many of you say this morning, yes, preacher, God spoke to my heart in a definite way. Would you raise your hand? No one looking, please. Anyone at all? God bless you. I see those hands. God bless you. Anyone else? Include me, preacher, in that closing prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for those that have come. We thank you, Father, for uh, those that have raised a hand indicating that you have spoken to them in a definite way. And I pray that you'd speak to each one of us, and I pray that we'd obey you. I pray, Father, that we'd seek to do your will. I pray that uh, we would identify anything in our lives that might uh, be an obstacle to us uh, having a greater worldview and uh, having more compassion. Lord, help us to be faithful to pray. Lord, we love you. We pray for anyone here that does not know Jesus Christ. I pray today that they might come to know him as their Savior. 
We ask now that you bless any invitation. And we pray that we would make great decisions for your glory and for our good. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.